Uh, I'm Richard Corey with ARB's Research Division. Really, it's a uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Kamen to discuss the uh, important role that uh, technological innovation is going to play in meeting the aggressive uh, climate change targets that we're uh, so focused on as an organization. Um, Professor Kamen is uh, Class of 1935, Distinguished Chair of Energy at the University of California, Berkeley, where he holds appointments of, in Energy and Resources Group, the Goldman School of Public Policy, and the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Dr. Kamen is the founding director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory. He's also co-director co of the Berkeley Institute of the Environment and is a co uh, lead author of the IPCC's report, which won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Dr. Cannon's work in science and policy of clean renewable energy systems, energy efficiency, the role of energy in national energy policy, international debates, and the use of impact of energy sources and technologies and developments is uh, quite distinguished, and we are uh, pleased to have him. With that, I'm going to introduce Professor Dan Cannon. Well, I'd like to. Oh. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here for all the work that that's going on at ARB and elsewhere. In fact, I feel like almost all the talks that I give outside of California are essentially just a litany of things that are going on that most of you have actually been the ones who've implemented. Um, the most common lesson that I feel like I tell in D.C. or in, in Europe is all of the neat things happening here. And so while I want to talk today about not only where we are a little bit in terms of greenhouse gas emissions cuts, again, many of you know this better than I because you manage it and do it on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm also very interested in what are likely to be the sources of the next round of deep cuts in emissions, and I'm hoping that actually in the Q&A, we get into some of those areas that are most exciting to you. And in fact, that kind of leads to just one man, uh, man, point of management, and that is I would welcome people who have questions that are either on content or are clarification um, to ask them right away. But if it's, the, if it's the massive philosophical one, I'd rather one hold those till the end. Those are often difficult during a talk. And so what I'm going to do is, again, run through some things that everyone probably is quite familiar with and then try to get into and spend the bulk of the time talking about a range of technology and policy issues and options that hopefully allow us to really advance the agenda of not only AB 32, but of the, the state's mid-century goals as well. And hopefully to report a little bit of good news that there is a number of sort of coalition of the willing partners that are coming on board as we speak. And so of the material in, in my research group, um, this, this title slide gives a highlight to the website of our laboratory here, it's rail, R-A-E-L, dot berkeley, dot edu. And the site is pretty updated now in the sense that it's now a searchable, it's powered by Drupal in terms of uh, the, the, the web stuff. So you can search it for documents, for dates, for um, people, for our published articles, interviews, actual footage of technologies, number of the wind turbines, for example, that our laboratory is operating and testing. You can actually go on, I believe, as of later today, and look at the outputs of them real time. And so there's a number of feedback in terms of what we're doing in the lab. And this group of the Renewable Energy Laboratory at Berkeley that I direct is somewhere between kind of a uh, romper room for energy, clean energy scientists and a policy shop. So we have physical hardware doing work on solar, mainly thin film solar cells, and some wind turbine work some work on gasification, and then a fair amount of people devoted to um, analytic work, uh, assessment of models, uh, look uh, cost and forecasting curves. And I'll try to illustrate some of each of those as we go through the material today. And again, feel free to, uh, to jump in if there's aspects of, of the story you want to uh, focus on in particular. Um, the framework I want to I highlight is what almost everyone says is the bottom line for thinking about significant cuts in carbon emissions, and that is we're going to need a diverse energy economy, and the, that economy is going to have to grow its sectors pretty strongly now very rapidly. And that's almost universal mantra, r regardless of your ideological perspective, but how one actually does it is somewhat challenging. And 
So my last couple slides will really try to take a look at what does it mean to find the mixture of investing in R&D and investing in scale-up programs for promising programs that we're likely to need to do to make the overall uh, low carbon economy come true. Um, as again, everyone knows here hopefully very well, um, energy efficiency has not only been our sort of greatest weapon and success, but it's also one that highlights a number of features about how to make things work. And I'll, I'll say more on that in a second. Um, and the lessons that we tell about energy efficiency today are not exactly the same ones we told about it a couple decades ago, and so it's worth keeping those in mind. Um, I'm a physicist by training. I do tend to think in sort of two-dimensional graphs and pictures of how technologies work, but I don't think there's any lesson that's more fundamental than we are going to need carbon pricing soon, not just in the AB32 process going on through ETAC and the market advisory committees and so the things we're doing locally, but we're going to need to have that carbon pricing, whether your favorite flavor of it is cap and trade or is carbon tax or is some combination. But the sooner we can get versions of that up and running, it's going to, it, it's probably the most fundamental piece of the story. I would personally, on a sort of a policy note, I would trade in lots and lots of neat individual programs of which I'm dearly devoted and love them if we could get a reasonable version of that up and running because many things that we're trying to do would be vastly facilitated, not just because of revenues available, but because it would allow us to start pricing the things that we're trying to get rid of. Many of our tools without that, things that have worked quite well in some sense, renewable portfolio standards, low carbon fuel standards, a variety of things that we, um, at least I personally am, am very fond of, would be vastly easier and would be actually be well replaced if we could get to carbon pricing. I believe right now, and I may be wrong on this one, that currently only Boulder, Colorado has a active carbon pricing scheme um, under consideration. I was in Berkeley yesterday when the city rolled out its plan for essentially meeting its 2050 goals of an 80% cut in emissions. And even there, even in uh, socialist Berkeley, the uh, carbon pricing was mentioned briefly and then moved away from it pretty quickly. And so we've got a long way to go to get this sort of thing in place. And you know, the last point will clearly be the mixture of R&D and deployment programs we're going to need to work through is going to be a challenge, and so we're going to have to look at that. So again, the, the bit of background, and, and, and my apologies for everyone who knows this or has it's tattooed somewhere on their forearm or something, but when you look at national emissions, the U.S. portfolio of emissions, as you see in the slide, has been increasing steadily, and in fact, the forecast by DOE's Energy Information Agency for where we're going is more of the same and more grim of the same. The uh, footnotes on that, on that path, of course, are the Kyoto Protocol that we uh, ignored. And there is a federal energy uh, reduction, uh, a carbon-based program. It's based around energy intensity, uh, the energy uh, required to make a dollar of GNP. It's actually an uh, interesting measure because it doesn't connect to any of the useful ecological issues about the actual stock and flow of carbon. It's a uh, an ecologically driven idea based around whether the economy is, is growing, we hope, or is stagnant. So it's, for a scientist, it's a real mismatch. And then the slide that I show frequently in DC, just to tick some people off, and often in Europe to kind of illustrate the scale, is that if California's AB32 goals were scaled up to be the size of the nation, so we scale from 30-some-odd uh, million Californians to the 300 million Americans overall, the version of AB32 and the governor's uh, executive order 305, the 80% reduction by 2050, that would bring us down to the uh, ecological sort of soft landing point, which is roughly 80% or more reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And there's some debate exactly where, but that's sort of a reasonable line in the, in the, in the sand, not in the Arctic ice, hopefully is that we scaled up the California program to be federal sized. This is roughly what the path would look like with the two red boxes, uh, the goals that we need to pass through for AB32, this roughly 25% reduction in emissions by 2020, and then again the governor's 2050 executive order of, I'm not the greatest operator of the pointer, of this 80% reduction uh, by mid-century. And again, that's the California plan scaled up. 
largely the material embodied in AB 32, in the now contested um, AB 1493, Pavli 1, and in the Governor's Executive Order 305, taken to a national scale. And again, this is the sort of picture that not only illustrates what we've got to do, uh, there are a variety of road mapping efforts, several of them here in this building, to think through the technologies we're likely to need, and kind of an informal assessment that we can develop pretty reasonable maps to get perhaps a third of the way down. And then after that, you are getting into a mixture of hope, some science, and ideology. And we're going to need to make this sort of path one that's got concrete aspects to how to do it all the way down, not just scaling up some of our current favorite best working programs, but really thinking about how to make this not only the law of the land here, but how to usefully collaborate with our neighbors geographically and in terms of climate protection, not only the, so the, the Reggie Coalition in the Northeast, but some of the emerging ones. And one particular collaboration, which is particularly exciting to me, that I'll do a show of hands in the room to see who knows about the emerging Midwest Coalition on Climate in some detail. So a minority of hands, but some, which is a good sign. And this is a, a very important evolving effort, and it does involve the Midwest states. Uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, a number of others are involved strongly in building their own coalition around these issues. One aspect of the story, which on a policy side is exciting to see, is that current uh, Wisconsin Governor Pawlenty is chair of the National Governors Asso Association. They will have, in the end of March of this year, its meeting where a version of not only a climate plan for the Midwest, but also a roadmap for technology development is likely to be rolled out. And a number of states, Minnesota in particular, has a very aggressive um, investment plan now put forward through ratepayer and some state money to really build a significant research and deployment machinery. And one of the things that Midwest states are remarkably good at is the Ag Extension Network. And no surprise, a lot of positive aspects of the Ag Extension are now being talked about in terms of an energy extension and training effort. When you start to think about a, West Co a, a Western Governors Alliance, a Reggie Coalition in, in, in the Northeast, and a major Midwest one where the wind resource is just phenomenal as well as some of the biofuel issues, you really start to get to significant pockets in a way that's not just the blue states and the red states having kind of a squabble over carbon issues. It's a pretty interesting evolution of the process. Um, again, the picture of the, 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 the uh, generic California summary of efficiency I put in because I'm, I'm committed to putting in every talk, no matter what topic it is, to putting a version of the energy efficiency story in there just to highlight how much of a change in policy one can get. There are experts in this room and on the web about aspects of the story, but the degree to which the savings that California has experienced, kind of this wedge of savings, not only of money, but of, of energy and of, of carbon emissions, is a dramatic piece of the story that I hope some of you have been surprised at how little is known of this, although people working in this building likely, you know, some of you have it tattooed on your left shoulder or something, because it's, it's, it's the... It's the it's the basic currency of what we, what, we can, uh, what we can really do here. And even here, the number of things that have happened are actually not even maxing out, not by far maxing out the energy efficiency opportunities. In Denmark, the uh, kilowatt hour use per person is even lower. And a number of programs here highlighting industrial refrigerators and freezers, a whole variety of technologies really do begin to talk about much lower possible levels than we've even managed to put in place here. And we have a question, so. So the purple line here, again, for those looking on, on the web, the purple line down this one is actually New York State. And so again, we try to highlight the California version of the story, but there are a number of, 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 of good actors, Rhode Island, a number of, of other states have, have been on this, on this positive side. And again, I usually highlight this one as well because while the reasons and the stories differ state by state, not just because I'm initially from New York, um, but that this is not just a warm weather phenomenon. This is not simply a California issue. It's really been a, a, an impressive story in a number of areas. And again, it highlights not only what we've done, but the added room to go. And you know, one restatement of those savings, now I'm going to mix 
electricity, stationary power, and mobile in just in terms of, 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 of megawatts, kilowatt hours equivalent, whatever, but that if we were to be as efficient as a nation as California is as a state, the savings would be larger than the total energy imports from off of North America. I'm lumping in our Canadian friends, even though they're giving us tar sands as well as part of the story. But there's a significant economic and geopolitical advantage to thinking about what has happened here as an overall part of the story. It's a significant amount of overall savings. Trends like this are going to have to start happening across a whole variety of aspects of our economy, and not just in the energy sector but in goods and services and a variety of features if we're going to make good on the AB32 and the 2050 social goals. And that's really where one wants to go. I'd be remiss if I didn't spend some time talking about the biofuels piece. This has certainly uh, become the hottest new thing for better or worse these days. And our lab at Berkeley and a number of colleagues, a number of you here, have worked intensely on it. When you look at the run-up in, um, in, in the biofuel market, the run-up in the policy pushes to promote biofuels, the tensions between getting biofuels from some of the current crops like corn versus some of the ones that we might get it from, be it sugar canes, switchgrass, et cetera, there's a real opportunity and a real challenge. And every time we turn over a new bit of that story, I feel like the challenge gets larger. And so if one were to start off with a rating of fuels, this is a slide from the National Resources Defense Council. Um, if you start off with gasoline, the red bar in the middle as your benchmark, took a while for this to register, um, showing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, per gallon of fuel, if gasoline is your benchmark, there's been a huge amount of press about the degree to which corn-based ethanol, and in particular corn ethanol, if derived, if, if um, distilled in a plant run on coal is actually a fuel that can be worse than gasoline in a straightforward form. And that as you get to the greener, I guess the bluer greener parts of these bars, you start to get to some of the uh, next generation biofuels from the cellulosic and other crops that, that do in fact have the potential for some very, very significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And again, our metric in doing the analysis, and our lab produced a, a paper in early 2006 that got a great deal of attention provided you know, sort of building the calculator for this. But you get some very, very low carbon possibilities. At the same time, if we begin to run towards use of tar sands and shale oils and using fissure coke processes to, to, to get liquid fuels from coal without sequestration, you start to get these brown bars and you get some very, very dirty per megajoule per mile traveled fuels. The challenge, of course, was to find a way around that, and the governor took the incredibly courageous step to highlight this low carbon fuel standard as a way forward that's been receiving a huge amount of attention, and we've been working on it with a number of colleagues at UC Davis and, and National Resources Defense Council, people in government here for a while, and that was to use the, 20, uh, the current number as a baseline and to highlight that that 2020 number needs to be our carbon content per mile traveled per amount of fuel is 10% is or more cleaner on a carbon basis than is gasoline. Now, those of you who have the uh, ethanol numbers firmly in mind know that with our roughly 5% of our gasoline mixed in with ethanol, you'll notice, well, if, if gasoline is our 2007 baseline, then technically we're a little bit better, but, but in fact because we're a little better today, but in fact, because a great deal of our ethanol is corn-based today, the savings are actually not so great. You're, a you're adding in a slight bit of cleanliness to the overall mix. This sets up the potential for an idea like the low carbon fuel standard to really drive the process. And um, we have presidential candidates on both the Democratic and Republican side that have endorsed and adopted versions of this. We have a long way to go. And in fact, the worries out there are in fact that large-scale use of biofuels, even with this metric for local use, really highlight some very troubling issues. The so-called indirect land use effects, meaning even if per acre of land and per amount of fuel we produce look good locally, if there is an offset of land taken out of food production here, but then needing to go into food production elsewhere, or even worse, a deforestation in for, in, for example, a developing country to access land for those fuels 
the savings that you see here can be absolutely swamped, lost over many times over by badly managed biofuels in the process. So even if our local life cycle analysis looks good, it's really this global calculus that we need to move towards. And there's an, emer an emerging body of work highlighting just how damaging destruction of standing nature can be in terms of thinking that this path alone is a positive one. That's going to be a huge challenge. I'll just finish the sentence. I'll get to it in a second. That's going to be a huge challenge. And in fact, the low carbon fuel standard in the work that my lab is doing sort of needs to evolve into something which makes the low carbon fuel standard just coming into effect look challenging. And that is essentially a sustainable fuel standard where the amount of water use and the amount of nitrogen deposition in the soils, as well as this indirect effect, is going to have to be part of that calculus. That is a challenge uh, sort of to, you know, that, that's going to be a major challenge as we go forward. And to the degree to which cleaner biofuels become part of our mix, that calculus will have to be part of our local, but also our global accounting. And I held off a question for a while. So let me uh, Jim Lerner from the ARB. <coughs> Dan, most of us in the audience know about ethanol fuels, mm -hmm. but those uh, light blue ones down there, um, Yep. defy the, uh, you know, it looks like a free lunch. So could you tell us wh what that is without maybe get going into too much techie detail? Thanks. So actually, uh, so a great question. I've, I've got one slide in here that I won't go over much to give some more detail. But the, the, the broadest version is that there are a number of trials taking place. There's one major trial in Minnesota at the University of Minnesota and a major trial in Nebraska, both of whom are finding in field studies that some of the cellulosic crops, including some of the prairie grasses and uh, um, um, some of the switchgrasses, have the potential, if managed properly in rotations, to actually sequester carbon in soils. The degree to which these could scale up, and, and I'm highlighting sequestering of carbon in soils is obviously not just getting you a fuel, which itself is a significant savings relative to gasoline, but by growing this crop, or the, like in, in many cases, these combination of crops actually begins to, uh, to, 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 to part carbon in soils. The soils become a sponge for that. The claims, notably, again, out of, out of the two groups I mentioned, the Minnesota and the Nebraska groups, are very intriguing. There's a lot of excitement about them. The question is, even if it's true at the fairly large-scale trial plots they're doing now, do these scale up? Do the farming practices that we could expect to do in real operation over time mean that these, these negative carbon biofuel systems are ones where there is an initial uptake of carbon by the soils, and then it relaxes back, or even worse, for example, under a global warming and drying scenario, that these actually then outgas carbon later on. And this is part of what's going on right now. I highlight this for two reasons, one of which is that this is an area of very active research right now. And it's also an area where the number of feedstocks being explored is not only very limited, but actually is largely emerging out of what we happen to think were, were promising cases in the beginning. And so I'll, I think it's on the next slide. Let me just check that before I bounce ahead. It's actually a few slides up. I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, to look at some of the crops that look promising today, but haven't been selected through a process that is scientifically uh, that, that broad yet. And in fact, more detail is in this follow-on one for those who want to explore it in, in a, little more, um, a little more detail later on. And that is that it's not just the range of fuel options it's, uh, in terms of making liquid fuels, but it's also what would be the uh, carbon benefits of moving away from liquid fuels entirely. And so two of the bars on this graph highlight the potential savings if we were to go towards using biofuels or using grid electricity to charge up plug-in hybrid vehicles, mass transit buses, a variety of other routes. I highlight electricity from biofuels is highlighted on here from one current study. Um, electricity from the California mix is down here. Electricity actually, as generated in West Virginia, is quite close in emissions, in life cycle emissions, to regular gasoline due to the amount of coal in there. Depending which scenario you look at, it's either a little bit better than gasoline or a little bit worse. It really does matter on your local 
uh, electricity grid, and um, so your your region matters a great deal in terms of how promising those look. You have another question. I think you are the virtuous outlier on, on this graph. Um, you are, well, it depends what your bicycle is made of, but you are effectively off this scale, yes. Um, you're, not a, you're, you're not a sequester unless your bicycle is made of biological material and you bury it every now and then. Um, but you are way down on the scale. You, you, you're, you are very virtuous on this picture, no question. Um, um, I'm not going to go in in detail, only because of time, to the, the work on plugins. We have a couple papers in our lab coming out. There is a series of interesting analyses being done right now at MIT, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, but part of the story here is really going to be to make these analyses useful, again, for plugins. For this life cycle part of the process is going to have to be mixed into the overall, into the overall equation. At Berkeley, in partnership with the University of Illinois and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, we received a very large, in fact, the single largest research grant that a university consortium has received from BP. And this is a $500 million, 10-year investment in better biofuels. That institute is launching as we speak. The first significant scientific retreat is actually going to be this Friday and Saturday. And the the, the baseline of the BP Berkeley Illinois project is that actually corn need not apply. And whether some wonderful corn crop will emerge later on that upsets the apple cart of the graphs I just showed you with these, these energy contents, the research contracts being provided to the researchers through this institute are explicitly not corn. There are a few cases and a few locations where corn when you use the stove or the whole plant in areas where you're not doing, where it's only rain fed, where it's very low fertilizer input, can start to look pretty good, do exist. There's not lots of them, and there's a great deal of area where um, corn as a carbon input intensive pro uh, product is a, is, is a significant loser on, on a carbon basis, they're all out there. That's pushed a lot of researchers to think about biofuels that effectively no, use very little or no land area, which is going to be a huge challenge. It sounds quite contradictory. Some of those projects involve algae biofuels. The uh, tanks down here, um, I believe, was National Geographic featured a version of these on its cover in the last month. Um, one of the interesting features about the algae fuels is that in some of the cases, one of the feedstocks they need is essentially warm CO2. So placing these around existing fossil fuel power plants, using them to capture CO2, using that to drive the algae process to then make biofuels was one very attractive one. Waste-based systems, the, uh, the dump truck and the, using land use in the middle, and then some of the mixed prairie grass systems all show a lot of potential. They all have issues. We need some enzymes that don't yet exist yet to break them down. Uh, some of the prairie systems are attractive, but they're relatively low yield per hectare. Each of these have some uh, significant challenges. Each of these right now, though, warrants analysis, again, under this broader framework, though, of life cycle analysis and not just the local version. If, there, if, if, if what's emerging from this indirect land use story, in fact, pans out to be true, the real challenge is going to try to be honest about the carbon content on a global basis for each of the hectares of land that go into agricultural production. It's not going to be an easy part of the process. I put one slide in here. I won't go through it now. This highlights one particular analysis. Uh, this is actually done by Lee Lind at Dartmouth. Um, and this highlights improvements in technology, improvements in fuel, in, 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 in the yields of fuels, uh, and using both summertime and wintertime growth to get some dramatic reductions in land area. I want to highlight one feature of the story, and that is um, vehicle efficiency better, um, uh, processing materials, but biomass yield. The current yield of one particular elephant grass, Miscanthus giganticus, which is, actually, um, which, is, which is native of China, has received a great deal of attention. And this is a fuel that, uh, this, this is a <laughs> fuel, this is, this is a feedstock that has yields currently of two to two and a half times that of corn, 
with very, very low input. And in fact, one of the features of this C4 plant is that at the end of its growing cycle, it actually returns the majority of the water and the nutrients back into the soil. And so at present, to a number of researchers, it looks like a, sort of a, a, you know, a near magic crop. And we'll find out if that's the case. That may, in fact, be the case. But the analysis and the evolution to find miscanthus as a high promising crop, uh, a, 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 a high potential crop, is not one that was some systematic ag extension outreach based effort. It was one that was known to a number of researchers involved in, the, in these projects. Great potential, but if we're really going to try to explore the, the potential biofuels that do have the potential to meet the carbon goals without the indirect effects or just the food competition effects, we likely are going to want to do a much more systematic approach. And that has not yet begun on a global basis, finding those fuels and evaluating them in a systematic sort of way. And I put that in for those who are interested. I could highlight more of it in questions, but I'm going to skip it. I'm going to jump to the other end of the spectrum because I really do want to illustrate today the range of types of innovations and some very non-traditional ones that, in my view, have potential to go in. And I apologize for everyone. My cute little graphic didn't come through because uh, the images were too large. So you can envision the Moscone Center roof, the roof of, uh, of a typical residential home. And, an interesting highlight in the world of photovoltaics, where the costs per kilowatt hour today are essentially the highest of all of the renewable sources, 25 cents a kilowatt hour and up for photovoltaics. I'm going to discuss the potential to dramatically change those numbers now. Um, California, as I'm sure everyone here knows, has a very aggressive 10-year plan. The California Solar Initiative, the so-called Million Solar Roofs, effort to bring down these costs by dramatically increasing the amount of solar that's installed. The CSI is estimated to lead to a, um, an installation of three to 10,000 megawatts, 4,000 megawatts is often cited as the amount we expect to install over the coming uh, decade, decade and a half. Um, and an interesting feature of solar here is that you really can think about scaling your technology in ways that are very unconventional for energy planners. The six-tenths of a megawatt of solar on the rooftop of the Moscone Center involves the same technology as the 2,400 watts of solar on the rooftop of many of the residential homes, like mine in, in, in Oakland, all the way down to the country that has the most solar installed per capita, not in terms of kilowatts, but the most photovoltaic systems installed per capita in the world is actually Kenya where 30 to 35,000 systems are sold each year at the whopping size of 15 to 40 watts per system. So this is the Apollo 13 story of, can you run your whole spaceship on the energy required to run a toaster? It may sound like a trivial amount of energy, but that's more energy, that's, that's more people receiving electricity as new customers each year from photovoltaics than are receiving it through the Kenyan national grid system, even before the real awful tragedy going on in Kenya, which is certainly a set the country back for a bit. My lab in East Africa has worked carefully on the market, on the technology for some time. It's a dramatic success story of importers and a very diverse network of installers and innovations in the technology feeding in very quickly because the number of installations is actually so high. And the East Africa story is now spreading to other parts of the world. Very significant piece of what's going on with the current technology. I'm going to highlight, though, a technical and then a policy innovation that have the potential to change that story completely. One of the features of photovoltaics is that because the, uh, the, 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 the panels are connected up in series, that shading of your system, be it physical shading because You've got trees in the way, early morning, your, your system is, um, is, is not in ideal alignment. You've got shade over part of the panels, shading due to branches, uh, bird poo, all manner of things, cracks, um, material junk on the panel, brings down your overall system output. So an, an, an obvious innovation when you think about it is to get away from the idea of arrays of solar hooked together where the poorest performing panel brings down the output of the entire system. And an interesting part of that is that there's a number of, of groups emerging that have said, well, we have expertise in, for example, the information technology world. 
Why not think about arrays of solar panels as essentially arrays of devices, each with their own IP address, talking through their individual inverters to a combination box. This is a little more like you know, your cable service uh, being, being your provider of your energy. And so if you have an array of panels, each feeding in, each one having its output summed up in your overall box, what you find out is that the, 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 uh, the improvement in efficiency, the improvement in output can be dramatic. And so one illustration of that is the following. A 4,000 a, a 4, kilowatt array of panels, uh, this is a trial rooftop with uh, the prototype inverters from one of the, the companies involved in this does the following. The blue line is the output of the exact same system with one overall system inverter. And what you see is that, like many systems, including mine and many, many others, that there is a, uh, there's a dead period. This, this system does not get into full enough sun to get the whole system functioning till mid-morning. You see this about, it's about 10.30 a.m. The system dramatically ramps up when the sun crests the back of the roof. And then the output rises up. And then at the end of the day, you have the opposite. We have a shading. The sun is too low in the west. And so you see this output profile in blue, this lower curve, for those of you who are uh, just looking on, on, a, um, on, a, on, a, on a handout, a printout, has a fairly typical shape for much of the solar installed around the world. The same exact system, no changes except for going to an inverter on the back of each panel then being summed by essentially a, um, a, a, a combination circuit is the red line. So what you see is this dramatic difference in the overall daily performance. In fact, that sums to a 34% overall difference in kilowatt hours produced for the exact same panels. So this is, this is, a, one sec, this is a technology neutral innovation in the sense that any of the panels that you put into this filtered through this, through, um, through these sets of micro individual panel inverters dramatically changes things. Solar right now, which is, in, which is undergoing a new renaissance of innovation on solar cells, is improving, at, is improving at an annual rate of significantly less than 1% per year in terms of overall system output. This is in some crude measure like getting 34 years of innovation R&D just at the cost of changing over the inverter difference in output between the two, the two systems. It's an exciting example of integrating the IT world with the, um, with, with the evolving solar renewable energy world to bring about the sort of thing that can radically change a very appealing to many people, but a higher cost technology option than many others. There's a question. Yeah, I've got a um, PVMI system on my roof too, but as I recall, the inverter was like one third of the whole system cost. And I'm looking at this thinking, okay, if you have a micro inverter or whatever you call it, I think you mean inverter up on top there. Um, what about the cost of those micro inverters versus the cost of a large inverter? Exactly, right. So the, the number cited, can, can people on the web hear the, okay. So this number, a third of the cost of the, of the system coming from your inverter is a little higher. It's not out of the range. It's a tad on the high side, but you're right. That's the price point that micro inverters will need to compete with. And we don't know yet exactly where that's going to come out, how quickly the prices come down. Right now, for the system I showed here, it looks like a winner very quickly. So in the particular um, technology I'm looking at, it looks like this one would win very fast. Whether that bears out long term, whether there's a learning curve for these microinverters, I would expect so, but we'll find out. That's what the, that, that, that's what the, what, what the business aspect of the story is going to prove to us. This does some other things, too, which is kind of interesting. It gets away from the, from, from the evolving requirement that many people were, were, were pushing for, and that is a way to bring down the cost of photovoltaic is to standardize systems. Because if you, op, if, if you match the size of your array of solar panels with the inverters and standardize the wiring, you can try to bring the cost down. And a number of groups, Vote Solar in San Francisco, working with San Diego Gas and Electric, worked very hard to try to get standardized packages a 1.5 kilowatt system, a two and a half, a four, whatever they might be, and to get the maximum sales of those. What this microinverter concept says is that that standardization, which is inherently not what you want from a distributed technology, you'd like to maximize out available roof space, available area, 
in whatever size system works for it. That this allows you to do that because as you add panels, you simply add the inverters that go with them. And so there are some significant other system benefits if this sort of approach ends up being a significant part of our, and we'll find out whether this ends up being a winning part of the story, whether the economics work out well. I, my suspicion is if I had to look at a single technical innovation that I thought could most dramatically change the economics of solar, it would likely be this and one I won't spend a lot of time on today, and that is uh, integrating the solar directly into your roofing or building materials. Because then you effectively amortize the cost of solar with the uh, roofing, you know, the roofing. So you don't have a solar roof over your regular roof, you build them together. But this one has a huge potential to, to change the situation. There was a question in the back. Okay. I'm wondering if you could speak to um, photovoltaic thermal technologies, which use the heat off the back of the panels. I heard a presentation about those recently, and they sounded like they were pretty uh, wonderful, too. So these, these, these are promising as well. And the issue, the issue is both panels perform better when every, every bit of temperature increase over just about ambient begins to bring down the performance. So coupling these systems in to, to, um, to draw away and access that heat looks promising. It's a, it, it's a reasonable technology, not likely by the, the studies we've looked at to buy you more than 10 to 15 percent additional energy output, but every bit is going to count. And this is also early and emerging. If they can do better, you'll do better still. And in fact, topical applications and all look even better still for this, for this electric to, to, to thermal conversion. So again, all of these look promising. Um, we'll find out which ones not only win out, but which combinations of these look very attractive. So it's another example of, of where, we might, where we might go with this. There are other emerging areas that look very attractive as well. They're just further off than the one I'm illustrating here and the one that I mentioned, including organic solar cells, self-repairing solar cells, spray-on solar. There's a whole variety of emerging things right now that may, that may change the story, and so I'm hopeful and we'll see. I'm going to highlight one other innovation that's not technological that in some ways changes the story as dramatically as this one, and of course, the combination of these two is going to be even more exciting. And that is a program recently announced by the city of Berkeley. And you can find a whole website about it on the Renewable Energy Labs website, as well as on the city of Berkeley. And that is to flip the financing of solar. And so what um, literally noticed by a, um, a clerk in the Berkeley Records Office was, why is it that we allow residents of the city to borrow money from the city to do a whole variety of improvements, like upgrading sewer lines or doing certain kinds of home improvements, and then pay it back on a property tax. Sounds like a logical thing. We have a long experience doing these so-called municipal assessment districts. Why not apply this to solar? That is the entire sort of conceptual idea. And it's, a rem and it's quite transformative when you think about it. The biggest problem with these residential systems, not just solar, but many of the costs of doing more efficiency upgrades than one might necessarily do is that upfront cost problem. Well, if you're allowed to finance a package of upgrades through a bond floated by the city that you then use and then pay back with an additional property tax assessment, that completely changes the economics of the deal. And so while the initial thought about this way, way back October 23rd was that this is something we should do for solar, the immediate idea that emerged was we should not do this for solar. What we should do is, in fact, package this with energy efficiency. And so the plan that has evolved in the city of Berkeley that was voted unanimously on by the city council and is now has a launch date already scheduled for sometime in June, which actually is a bit intimidating to us working on the program because there's quite a bit of financing issues required to be done by then, is that there will be a menu of energy efficiency upgrades of which a homeowner must do a portion of, and then you are eligible to do the solar. And a number of the test packages that we've looked at by looking at actual homes in Berkeley and what it might look at is about five to $8,000 of energy efficiency upgrades 
and then a roughly ten to fifteen thousand dollar package to put solar on your roof, done together, efficiency first, followed by solar. This effectively brings down the overall cost of doing just solar as you might do it now where you install, you, you install it, you get your rebate back from the state later on, and but you, you finance most of it yourself, and you paid for effectively 20 years of electricity up front, brings down the effective cost of solar from, for example, 25 cents a kilowatt hour to this new hybrid of assessment district finance efficiency and solar to a cost that is not that much different than what we pay for grid power today. A financing innovation that comes close to dropping the overall cost by a half. Now, there are a whole bunch of caveats and details of this process. Right now, the interest, uh, the payments that you would make on this are deductible at the state tax level, but are not deductible at the federal level. And there's a big benefit if we wanted to make this available at the federal level turns out there's a mechanism to request an IRS waiver on this, which is being pursued. And there's also a legislative solution that um, Speaker Pelosi is, is championing to get those deductions made at the federal level. Again, it is essentially flipping the process where you borrow the money, where, where, where you're borrowing from the city to, to install these. There's a number of things that are going to be tricky to figure out. One of the things, again, many people in this room have worked on is that a program like this that pays you for efficiency upgrades is very tricky or very person power intensive to manage. You're going to receive a check from the city to cover X number of efficiency upgrades. That's a check that is potentially pocketable unless there's a process to make sure you do those efficiency upgrades. So there's a number of processes worked out right now where inspectors and demonstrating through your bills, and ironically enough, if one was to have these sorts of solar systems installed, turns out that the inverter and the communication between the inverter and the companies that install it would allow you to fairly easily see if those efficiency upgrades have been done. Um, one of the cute things of the system here is that your solar panel system would appear on, the, uh, on their host computer, and you could receive an email uh, or a cell phone call to say, by the way, panel number nine needs to be cleaned or has bird poop on it or something. Um, and one could look for the signatures of various efficiency upgrades that were or were not done. So there are mechanisms to uh, manage the, the financing around the efficiency. Solar is, of course, much easier. The solar panels are either on your roof or they're not. You can tell if they're physically there, and you can tell pretty directly from the system if they're, if they're, if they're in use. So that one is easier, even though the efficiency is likely to save you more and more quickly, but it's this kind of packaging that's being worked out right now. And so the Berkeley program, expected to go live again with a trial in June, is currently under review by the Attorney General for how to turn this particular program into a statewide effort. Turns out it, it requires designating the state to be effectively what's called a charter city, a area where charter cities, those cities that receive state or federal funds and have been audited, in those cities, they can enact these things. And right now, again, the AG's office is looking at ways to effectively declare California a charter solar state, which I think sounds kind of good. So I highlight this because if you start thinking about the benefits of these significant technology improvements plus the improvements on the financing side, some of the technologies that seem far off in terms of being cost effective with the grid right off dramatically change in the future. So again, a highlight of where we're going. So I will, I'm going to skip over, over a little bit more so we have some more time for, for Q&A. I do want to highlight that as much as people talk about California and a few other states being really in the vanguard, in fact, there is a pretty dramatic pool of, uh, of, of, re, of, sort of, of progressive locations on the clean energy mix. This map here shows the currently the 29 states that have versions of the Renewable Portfolio Standard in place. California has, of course, as you all know, has one of, if not the most aggressive RPS in the country. It depends on your definition a bit. New York likes to claim they are the uh, leader in this regard to some degree, and we uh, push back for a variety of reasons. But this is a significant map of demand for clean energy technology. Things like these microinverters, these finance schemes, 
are of interest to a significant block. And again, you can see not only you know, our, our most familiar Western block, where we now have, thankfully, RPSs up and down the coast, the Reggie Coalition area, and again, this emerging upper Midwest one that I mentioned before, with Wisconsin and others playing this uh, fairly aggressive role in Minnesota, this aggressive role in developing their own mix. Um, and again, I won't spend more time on that, except to note that of these 29 states, currently 10 of them have an extra set aside, an extra benefit in terms of meeting the RPS by investing in solar power. So Nevada has a carve out for solar. California now not only has the California Solar Initiative, but also a, a newer piece um, to promote solar thermal. So there is a significant growing market out there, which is all the darling of the venture capital world right now, of places where these technologies really could be deployed rapidly. And one thing, depending on your read and your take on the post-OPEC history, is that the mixture of having public sector support, private sector support, and a clear demand base is significantly different today. So there is reasonable to, reason to be optimism, even if uh, we hear elsewhere, we hear differently from DC. Let me just highlight one feature very quickly that's received a lot of recent attention, and that is this uh, empirical and model-based finding that a number of groups have looked at and that is the job benefit, the, so the job dividend by going green. And the, the, the rough conclusion of a variety of the studies is that per dollar invested, per megawatt uh, um, installed, there's a significant benefit of extra jobs generated, many of which by definition need to be local, can't be outsourced, but some of which will still likely be built elsewhere if your solar panels or wind turbines are produced elsewhere. That comes from going green. And sadly, in some sense, this jobs dividend doesn't have to do with some, some, you know, some wonderful feature of clean energy, be it solar, um, being renewables and energy efficiency. It really has to do with the extra jobs generated by developing a new infrastructure, which means that in a map like I just showed of the United States, that this jobs dividend will decrease over time and will likely not be there or not be significant when the 48, 49, 50 states decide to go green. And again, there's a lot of, of, risk, of risks and issues for places like California going first, which we've all, by definition, adopted. But there are also some of these benefits of being the leader in this regard. And again, you can add up the amount of jobs generated. Uh, all the presidential candidates who are interested in this, and that essentially um, means all the Democrats and McCain and a couple others, have highlighted the job growth through energy efficiency and renewables by hitting targets like 15 and 20 and 25 percent renewables and efficiency by various times in the future. Of course, that 15 percent federal version of an RPS was, of course, defeated in the last uh, round of Senate discussion. So we've got a long way to go. And again, there's deep, there's data on the paper on the jobs per megawatt, jobs per dollar numbers that one can look at for once later on. I'm also going to highlight, yes. Um, Brandon Rose with ARB, uh, formerly uh, Renewable Energy Program. Um, and I know there's been uh, very little work done on this job issue. Have you run into in more recent years um, additional work on actual number of jobs created per megawatt? Well, there's actually a fair amount now. The study I highlight here was actually done initially in 2004. It was an assessment of studies of job generation as well as the models that my lab built uh, in response to a Senate testimony, the Apollo Alliance, Natural Resources Defense Council, Greenpeace, a number of groups have done studies in the 2001 to 2005 period of time. This has now become all the rage. And in fact, a study that we um, to de uh, helped to develop for Cal EPA, uh, largely based at UC Berkeley, not only did this empirical version, but then used a empirical model um, the bear model that some of you may have used to assess the job growth, for, uh, the, the likely job benefit of a renewable or clean energy intensive strategy. This has now been echoed by all kinds of groups that are not your normal actors. There is a Cato study of jobs benefits, and they also include something which I feel like we should have done too. They included a security dividend by the jobs generated in this and a 
somewhat quirky in my view, but a metric of reduce risk to US soldiers by a reduced imported oil quota. I like the idea. The source is kind of surprising, and their metric was quite bizarre. It distinguished between people who were ship-based and plane-based. It was a little too detailed for, for my liking on this. But it highlights these issues. And in fact, the uh, slide I showed in the next one is an update that we just produced in September 2007 for a US Senate uh, uh, committee hearing. So if you go onto the RAIL website, and you, I believe it was September 25th, it was for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. You can download this document, which updates all the numbers in the early study based on a larger sample of solar, uh, solar, wind, biofuel, and efficiency companies. And there's now a group working out of the UK. They're, they're based in, in, in the Orkneys. It's actually a, a European Union group um, called EMIC, the European Marine Energy Center. It's now doing a jobs uh, dividend for hydro, um, geothermal, and tidal power to largely demonstrate in their hope that tidal power is the jobs winner. So it's become a bit of a cottage industry to tally these numbers up. In fact, in one of um, Senator Clinton's campaign ads in California, she actually touts a federal program that would produce, in her claim, 5 million new jobs over roughly the next 20 years. That number is considerably larger than the numbers that my study uh, found, but I'll let people battle it out for whose study is more just. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Right. Okay. So the question is, this is net or gross jobs, essentially. Is this new jobs generated, jobs that translate from one area to another, and does it take into account jobs lost in other areas? For example, coal. It does not do the latter. It does not take into account jobs lost from other areas that go down. There is a, um, again, this bear model study for California that does take that into account. They concluded that that penalty was relatively small in the western US. They did not do a version for West Virginia, Ohio, a number of places where this might be a bigger issue. They, they, they chose wisely, shall we say, where, where they did this version. Germany, however, has done this version. And the current, the 2007 numbers for Germany, again, the country that now is the leading installer of wind power in the world, very aggressive installer and producer of solar and wind, concludes that the 25% of their economy, of their energy economy built around renewable energy, produced more jobs last year than the entire fossil fuel sector. So a 25 to a 75. And in fact, there is a jobs bill now introduced largely for more, you know, for more job growth in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Germany, designed to place many of these renewable jobs explicitly into companies that, are, that were fossil fuel, notably coal holders. So there is not only theoretical work, but there's some practical efforts to try to uh, get balance, I think. Great question. OK. Um, uh, the US, of course, and developed countries are not the only places these are going on. I highlighted the Kenya solar case before. But China is a place where this is very interesting for a whole variety of, of means. And, I won't get into today in the interest of time the, the China coal story, but one, uh, one story going on right now is a collaboration of researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, Harrison Fraker, is the, is, the, is the now retiring dean of the College of Environmental Design, the lead investigator on this study. It's, it's joined with two Chinese cities and the Ministry of Construction. And this project is to re-envision the mega blocks that are being built in China. They are essentially kilometer square gated communities going up at a rate of about one per week. And this effort is a ecological version of that story where integrating solar and solar thermal onto buildings, wind on higher buildings, and use of, of, of the human and uh, municipal waste to make energy is looking at what is the potential to have break-even or better than break-even overall energy uh, analysis. A lot of work going on as we speak. The first of these eco blocks, as they're being called, is scheduled for, constru for initial construction starting this summer. 
And we will find out you know, in combination if this overall system works. But it's got all the components you might expect. The fact that many of these, uh, of these blocks are treated already in China as essentially as I say, gated communities allows kind of a natural unit. And it's about a 40 to 55,000 person urban neighborhood that is being looked at. And the, the final partner in this is actually a group called Arab, which is the world's largest sustainable design firm. They have, they have a central office. They are based in the Netherlands. And they are a commercial partner with the Chinese government and with this team. There should be a series of results. There will be a major conference on this coming out. The hope, of course, is that there will be multiple of these um, to, to be toured at the Olympics. And a whole variety of efforts have gone in around this effort. I think we have a hand up on the question. Whoops. I did that accidentally. Are uh, edible plants or urban ag included in this uh, model? Yeah. Not only edible plants, but actually medicinal plants are also included in this because of the, uh, the, the strong role of, of Chinese uh, herbal medicine in the process. So again, we'll see which of them bear out. But this systems aspect of the whole story is very attractive. And again, China is a, a key player in this. And so it's exciting to see these models of emerging in a variety of locations. I'm going to conclude, because I think I've, I've, I've wanted to leave some time for questions here, with just a bit, a bit of the depressing backstory. Um, the ones it's worth, worth highlighting. And that is, this shows federal energy and other R&D investments back to the 50s. And what you see here, in addition to the uh, very large defense expenditure, the top piece of this, you see the uh, space exploration budget with the Apollo program here. You see the basic science budget running along. And then the red, if you have the color version or that line, which looks like a python that swallowed a pig, that is the federal energy R&D budget. And I draw your attention in particular to the feature that the federal energy R&D budget, after going through its exuberance after the OPEC crisis, has come back down to essentially late 1960s levels even today, despite the importance of the energy economy and all these, and these issues. But contrast that to the blue line above it. This is the biotech health research budget where a concerted federal effort took place, lots of private sector involvement, public sector uh, as well, to double the NIH, the National Institute of Health budget, over a 15-year period. That program was successful. They did double the budget. And there's been a variety of studies about how effective or not it was. One interesting aspect of the story that is worth highlighting perhaps more than any other is the degree to which, if you look at the same picture and just pull out the energy piece of the story, what I just showed you was the federal energy R&D budget as the open circles here, the private sector energy R&D budget, which did not go through that, I guess, irrational exuberance in the OPEC response and became more and more dismal since, has only begun to turn around on the private sector now, where it's just about uh, comparable to the, federal, to the federal budget. But that this pattern of private sector investment lagging, or maybe now in the last couple of years just about catching up, is completely different than what we saw in biotech. In the biotech world, while the federal biotech budget went through a doubling, private sector investment in biotech went up by a factor of 14. So concerted federal efforts can not only generate more returns on their own, but it is largely attributed to the changing biotech world, to the federal government playing a priming the pump role, not being the prime contractor, as it essentially has been, sadly, for some time in energy, can have some dramatic returns. And there's lots of interesting measures that I won't get into today. They are on our website to highlight what the correlation between federal dollars spent and patents generated as one metric of the uh, innovativeness in the field shows that while the overall spending levels have been depressing in many areas, the return on investments have, for many of them have been, have been quite systematic. I, there has been a strong correlation, not necessarily causation, but a correlation between money spent and new innovations generated 
And while California stands out as a state that actually has invested in R&D, there are few partners. In fact, the new program in Minnesota I've been alluding to is a significant state effort to essentially jump into this category of which New York and California are just a very few of the states that have significant R&D budgets of their own. Let me, I'm going to skip this in a matter of, uh, yes. So the, the question um, for those following along is on the picture I was looking at, which I've just paged back to, this is all energy research. Um, I, you know, in the next graph, the, 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 the panel graph shown here, if you want to go through, there is data on each technology, but that overall graph shows everything. It lumps nuclear, it lumps renewables all together, and one can pick them out individually in the story. In the story. And again, I put the citations at the bottom of the page. Uh, you can download the articles direct from the rail website. It's become a bit of a cottage industry here, too, to update the numbers and look at not only patents, but, for example, citations per patent and a variety of metrics. And one graph I'm not showing you here, although it, it is available in this particular paper, this 2005 paper, is that citations per patent in the energy field and across the entire U.S. R&D portfolio were about the same up through the early 80s. And then they began to diverge. And today, patents in the energy field are cited, i.e., you know, sort of effectively reused or looked at, almost a third less than patents across the overall economy. So there are some structural issues that we have introduced into the energy field that mean essentially that we are examining and utilizing our own energy R&D far less aggressively than we are in, in, in the overall economy and the overall mix of R&D. And in fact, we're much more than a third down when you compare energy to biotech. So there are some real needs for a, a renewal and innovation. And I'm going to put up one last slide to highlight here at the end. One tool that we've been working on with ARB right now is to develop carbon calculator footprint tools, a very popular pastime these days, that are particularly useful for companies, individuals, and cities to evaluate their purchases. And the you know, interesting aspect of doing this is that, one, you can look at the carbon content of energy, but also the carbon, the greenhouse gas content of goods and services more generally in what we are consuming. My hope, and I believe the hope of the ARB, is that we make these tools available to get all of us as citizens, but particularly to, to municipalities and companies, on a trial basis to find out how useful they are in terms of redirecting purchases, durable goods, non-durable goods, services, and then over time, make greenhouse gas accounting that next metric that we bring strongly into place. And one short story on this is that the uh, power company, Scottish Power, um, an innovation in their Portland, their US headquarters, was to require all deals the Scottish Power entered into to go through exactly this carbon audit. Now, Scottish Power doesn't require that the winning deal in each case has the best carbon signature, but they require it for all projects. And whether it's an unofficial policy or not, the trend line over the past six years since they started this has been the projects that Scottish Power as a portfolio has picked, have been 20 to 25 percent less carbon intensive than their portfolio looked beforehand. So the accounting, the process has mattered. Again, whether you think it's because managers are giving the top-down message or whatever set of internal criteria, doing the accounting dramatically matters. Now, one last feature, and then I'll leave this, because this website's available to anyone who wants to take a look at it. Um, this is a prototype of the calculator. The website is BIE, that's Berkeley Institute of the Environment, dot Berkeley, dot edu, forward slash calculator. That's BIE, dot Berkeley, dot edu, forward slash calculator. There's no www. And it provides a dynamic one where you can input vehicle type, miles traveled, are you vegetarian, are you not? which purchases, and it will allow you to look at what your carbon signature is for foods purchased, for durables, non-durables, and again, our hope in collaboration with ARB 
is to make these sorts of tools really address the questions that we need to ask. Notice that any calculator like this can do a pretty good job of telling you whether it is better on a carbon basis to walk or bicycle from here to China. But what a calculator has a hard time doing because there's a lot of data required is to tell you is it better to fly United or ANA to China. The data required for that is very detailed, but that's the level we're going to need to aim towards if we want to make this not only a commercially interesting thing to do, but one that allows you to distinguish between similar services. And that's next on my horizon. And again, I've been on it for a while. I'd love to use the last time, the time for questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for hosting me here at JRB today. Sure. Okay, so some emails have come in, and I will try to run through them. Um, Dan, you mentioned that some form of carbon pricing, be it a carbon tax or cap and trade, is key to emission reductions. Correct. I, I believe it. I agree with it. In the same way this accounting was required, we're going to need to get uh, we're going to need to get that in place. What about changing land use patterns to support more infall, where uh, infill, infill, uh, where new and existing residents drive less, etc.? And I am very strongly convinced that land use planning, which everyone likes to cite, but no one likes to actually do, based around this, is going to be critical of the process. And there's a very very nice editorial in the Census Chronicle today highlighting exactly this issue. In many ways, this may be the hardest piece of the story because it doesn't cross a firewall, but it crosses some areas that we have traditionally talked about but not implemented. And if we're going to make these things happen, walk to latte, walk to BART, walk to low carbon X and Y is going to be needed. And I, I believe that integrating what goes on here, what goes on at housing agencies, what goes on at permitting of new buildings is going to need to be part of the process, which is a real challenge, but the tools are now emerging to get us there. Another question. There seems to be an assumption that electricity use is being reduced with no increase in other forms of energy. Is this correct? Ah, okay. So this goes back to that efficiency graph with electricity, the sort of California story. Is it in fact the case that decreasing or keeping electricity use roughly constant per capita has not come with other uses. Right. This is a complicated question because making your homes more efficient save you money and don't have any clear indication that that is in fact has driven us to do more things. I, to keep that graph low, we've incentivized people to use more natural gas. That has in fact not happened. Utilities have had aggressive programs to educate and actually to reward you with the 2020 program of electricity, the 2010 of natural gas. But at the same time, California is very strongly greenhouse gas tied through transportation. Right? In fact, transportation uh, constitutes the largest, I'll just the largest fraction here relative to other states where it's a smaller bit. So we are vehicle and transportation intensive, and so it's an issue. So not linked directly to electricity use, but it is obviously a major piece of California's challenges to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to address. Should forest fuel wood, small diameter trees, be considered a preferable feedstock for conversion to biofuels? Same as Kansas and Cisco. So we're going to find out. Uh, questions like fast growing trees, waste from sawmills, will need to be put through the sort of low carbon fuel standard calculators that I showed. And we're going to need to look at these land use impacts, both direct and indirect, to answer this kind of question. That's unfortunately a complicated thing to require, but Given the emerging information as we talked about in the talk, we're going to need to do just that sort of study to def and make it part of our policy making to really make a low carbon biofuel strategy a winning one. And so the analysis that, again, our lab has been doing, to my mind, points to A, we're going to not only need to make waste first our biofuel strategy, but my suspicion is that two decades hence, making liquid fuels at all is going to look silly. We're sure to still be doing it, or I suspect we're sure to be doing it. But liquid fuels rel relative to gasifying whatever biofuels we do use and using that to offset natural gas to mix with whatever coal we're still burning and to use that as a, a fuel to then power up electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, is, is by our calculations 
looking strongly like the winning route. Much easier, of course, said than done. And I think you look nice. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I kind of understand why the R&D for energy is the way it is. Um, I grew up in kind of that environment. And the time it takes to put in a major hydrocarbon project into action and the amount of capital that it takes to put a major hydrocarbon project into action are actually kind of mind-boggling. I'll give you a, a, a kind of a project that's currently ongoing. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, there is a major oil field called Yad Avaran, who is uh, right now in the early stages of its development. Right now, it's producing maybe something like 17,000 17, barrels of oil per day. That's not a whole lot. But in order to get it to produce 700,000 barrels of oil per day, which is its full capacity, you're going to need 20 years, and you're going to need roughly in the area of 15 to $30 billion. Yep. Um, put yourself in the, in the, in the shoes of... Um, the entrepreneur or the investor who is going to be doing this investment. It's a heck load of money. And we're talking this heck load of money is going to be away from your pocket for a couple of decades. And God only knows what's going to happen in the meantime. So for you to be making this kind of investment decision, you either have to have hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars and security only Almighty has seen or some versions of that. So these kinds of decisions are really difficult to make in the, in, in the energy sector. And again, I want to remind the audience that between 1987 to 1997, the price of petroleum on this planet went from something around $34 to $32 to something like $9.90 a barrel. At that level, many oil fields in Texas and California could no longer afford to produce. Given these levels of uncertainty, I think it's kind of understandable why the energy R&D has been kind of anemic. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I think you can even sort of go further in the stories and look at not only that story, but once you get invested in a project and you've committed investors, the degree to which one will exert influence to find the subsidies to make those projects stay afloat until they, they, they begin to pay out. Because once you're invested in it, it's very hard to turn it off. And many people have looked at what happened with TXU in Texas. It's kind of an example of this wonderful turnaround. TXU was proposing 11 coal-fired power plants. After pressure, kind of an interesting semi-hostile buyout and, and this one. They, they reduced that dramatically down to two. Wonderful story. Nine coal-fired power plants not built. I'm not going to stop at that at all. In fact, there's a uh, bit of emerging dialogue that what TXU actually planned initially was more like two. They proposed 11. They got two in the end. And that was the two which they felt they had relatively solid financing for. So the stories, you know, there's a good and a bad side to the story. And we will see. I, I do think that one thing in there is really highly an important issue, and that is the estimated amount of capital to be spent by India, China, and the U.S. on coal-fired power plants over the next decade exceeds a trillion dollars. Every bit of that that gets spent is going to be very, very hard to shut down early unless you envision carbon prices or policies that are so much stronger than we've demonstrated an ability to do today that we will live with those choices for a long time, four, five, six, or more decades, if we don't find the, you know, find the tools and the courage to make those choices early on. This is going to be a huge challenge. And by the way, as, as everyone here I suspect also knows, there is a Saudi Arabia worth of oil sitting in those Albertan tar sands with transport and other mechanisms very close by. And at 100 bucks a barrel, the $30 a barrel of energy equivalent needed to separate that tar sands into gasoline looks like a bargain. And if we were to ever burn through all of Alberta's tar sands, 
Venezuela has an equally large, although somewhat harder, geologically to get at reserve. So, tough equation. Hi, I had a, just a question about the Vattenfall slide that you skipped, and I've seen <laughs> that uh, study cited in so many places, and I wondered if you could just comment on how well regarded it is, and also maybe comment on are there other sources in the literature that really get at cost effectiveness, and where can we find that information? So I, I did skip over it in the time. I, I, will, I will encourage anyone to look at it. It should look like the sort of um, um, uh, cost of efficiency, or in this case, the cost of, of avoided or conserved carbon graphs that people in California are used to, but now applied to carbon. Widely cited study, very influential intellectually, very wrong in terms of many of the numbers. But the value of this study isn't in the details of whether you believe these bars, but for the message it illustrates. And our lab is actually gearing up right now to do a very large integrated reassessment, a road mapping exercise to put numbers that we believe to be accurate in here. And not just in one sector, because for example, wind and natural gas have some very nice complementary features. Wind, for example, and nuclear do not. So there's a lot of interactions between these bars that are of use. The feature I want to draw your attention to is that some of the current discussion about low carbon strategies, notice that we have all this kind of efficiency, the ones that pay you back if you're kind of an, um, um, an, um, an economic um, optimist, is that it's not five or six or seven individual blocks on this graph. This is made up of many, many, many technologies, i.e., it's not likely to be a simple picture of we pick our four or five favorite ones. We are likely to need R&D portfolios and deployment portfolios that allow all of these kind of thousand flowers to bloom, and we'll see how much of each one we do. But in terms of the individual numbers per bar, I personally not only don't believe them, but don't recommend you believe them, but I do recommend that you think a lot about the message in this kind of, of, of analysis. I believe not only this, this Vattenfall version, which came from a McKinsey version, is not only very powerful, but is fundamentally right. The numbers are, I believe, fundamentally wrong, but we'll get to those later. I'm glad to hear that uh, the recent focus at the end of this about the opportunity cost of capital, because it's such a critical issue. You hear often that nuclear is a potential savior in global warming, but when you look at the opportunity costs, I think of capital for nuclear, you get a whole lot of renewables and efficiency for that. But two solutions I haven't really heard you speak much to yet are capital intensive, and that is carbon capture and storage and mass transit. And I wonder if you'd speak to those two potential long-term solutions. You hear deep cuts, you kind of hear CCS and, and mass transit. And the, other key issue is on the presidential debate, there was just an article in the paper that said like four questions out of 3,000 by the media were related to climate. And my kind of view is that it, you know, it, public perception and public awareness, while it's on the rise, um, I think is a key part of the, the deep cut issue. And I wish you could speak to those. Yeah, so I mean, you're absolutely right. This is, no matter how much we think in this building and in this state, you know, this, this, this part and parcel of the language we speak, it is not the language we speak nationally. Unfortunately, we've got a long way to go. The coverage of these issues is very bizarre in many ways. Not just the, you know, I'm a uh, card-carrying member of the IPCC, and whenever I give a sort of talk on the climate issues, 90% of journalists need to go find that one climate skeptic to partner you with so that it's quote, unquote, a debate. Um, so we have a huge direction to, way to go on this. The only thing that gives me kind of, uh, kind of more, more hard is there is that while things are certainly not perfect in Europe by a number, by any means, this dialogue went relatively quickly. It's not just that kind of this, there's this vague idea that Europe is somewhat more socialist than we are, which often gets cited, but that people saw these things in a variety of ways. And one of the things that had a big impact was a number of European civic leaders and groups not only decided green parties were a neat thing, but did not want their cities to look like U.S. cities. And a strong impetus was, let's not make you know, the evolution of, of Berlin and Gothenburg and all look like um, Oklahoma City. And that, that, those messages went a long way. They do have more of a, a social view on these things we do. There's a lot of features of it. But it's, it's a doable change. So it's one that we all have to work on. And in fact, I would also say that 
that go to the moon, that Kennedy-esque speech has not yet happened on climate change, no matter how much you might happen to like what Al Gore said or what Jim Hansen said in the given thing. We do not have that. I choose to go to the low-carbon place and do the other things. We have not done it yet, and we'll find out how much of a push that will happen. Um, you know, their policies on other issues aside, all of who I consider to be the leading presidential candidates, and I, of course, like many, have my preferences, all of the leading candidates on this issue are pretty good to quite good. And none of them are as good as California, but they are all pretty reasonable. And that's a different position than we've had in the past, so that's a feature. Carbon capture, other uh, capital-intensive technologies. is a huge challenge. Not investing that money in coal would free up lots of money from interested investors to do things. Much of that money is, in fact, tied to coal in ways that may be hard to move, hence the interest um, in carbon capture. I am personally interested to see the work going on on CCS, but I'm pretty skeptical for a bunch of reasons. One is I don't like banking a huge amount on a technology that currently does not exist. You know how to do it theoretically, it's not deployed, and many of the cost numbers for CCS, interestingly enough, over the last couple of years, are actually rising and not falling. And that's before you have any risk insurance for leaking carbon and all manner of things. So I believe we need to work on it. It is not the one that, attra that excites me in a lot of ways. And to put it in context, the current cost for, um, for future gen, for the clean coal plants, is actually on par with nuclear. So it may do some wonderful learning curve, some cost reduction curve, never before seen in history. But the current numbers are, you want to do coal clean, it's more expensive than nuclear. And that raises a whole number of issues, again, before we start indemnifying carbon leakage risk and all kinds of things down the line. So we're better doing one more. The, I, think uh, I think I have the last question. Okay. My name is Frank Harris. I'm a Southern California. I said I have a long laundry list, but I think I should proceed quickly. And so I'd like to uh, give a critique, if you will. I'm an environmental economist and actually a former UC prof, such as yourself, although not at Berkeley. But um, one of the failures that I see in this discussion uh, is really the issue of uh, distribution. If you look at something like an environmental Kuznets curve, where the economic value of uh, investing in environmental protection exists here, perhaps not the most economically efficient uh, projects exist here. Can we, uh, I, I see a real need to really kind of move the discussion away from what's technologically feasible to one of economics and politics to see what can be achievable. Frankly, much of the McKinsey, if you will, high range phase uh, uh, reductions require a level of political and economic coordination that, frankly, I'll climb a ladder to the moon before that happens. Well, I'd rather do this, but I'll, I'll, I, I won't disagree with the, uh, the challenges here. This is, a, this is a great question. In fact, there's multiple versions of the distributional issues. You know, there, there are lur also lurking social issues here, too. There is the issue that many of these deployment programs that have received a lot of analysis and attention are, in fact, subsidies by all of us for the more affluent. There's a real challenge in, in finding ways to diversify these programs. There are some efforts. Some of the recent attention around green collar jobs, the jobs that are not outsourceable is part of ways to look at that, but there is a long way to go to make that, that, that picture hold up. And the degree to which those discussions about what are the viable pathways often come back to how can you use a combination of public sector know-how and some resources and a broader mix of private resources to make these things not only good on a carbon basis, but good investments. And there's a lot of challenge there. And you mentioned Kuznets curves. I want to highlight, because not everyone may be familiar, this is the idea that the pollution index for development often goes through a, a path where we become more polluting and then less polluting after some threshold of affluence. If all countries or even all regions go through that, we've got some real challenges. Part of the process that gets discussed a fair amount is can you essentially do versions of what often called leapfrogging or tunneling, depending who you are, if you're an Avery Levins or a Jose Goldenberg, 
can you essentially not just pick off those technologies that are lower cost? And again, there are economists and not economists who believe aspects of the story are told, but any of them within negative costs are quite suspect to some people. But can you find ways to skip some of the deployment stages of the more capital and polluting intensive and go to the cleaner ones more directly? An example that often gets cited, not an energy example, is the rebuilding in places like Uganda, where the decision after the Civil War and after the, the technology devolved was to not ever go through the rebuilding of a pole and wire infrastructure for communications, but to go directly to a cellular version. Can you think about that on an energy frontier where and local energy resources used locally don't, uh, don't require large capital infrastructure and, 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 a, and a lot of associated emissions? Are things like the, uh, the microinverter technology and some of the financing mechanisms to do that? That's exactly right now what is being explored by a number of groups. And we're going to find out. California is on the lead on a number of these things, but California also has a grid that is arguably strongly in arrears in investment to make many of these distributed options happen. So we've got a whole number of challenges. Now, our kind of optimism waxes and wanes a bit here. We were super optimistic September 28, 2006, after AB 32. Then we notice we have a major structural deficit, and you get a lot of pulling back. And it's going to be a big issue. I'm not going to page back to the first slide, but the, the slide that I put up that showed the California greenhouse gas reduction task scaled to the nation highlights what I actually think is the real worry in the, back, in the background. And that is that as much interest and excitement there is over doing these things now, we don't yet face a cost for these pollutants. And private individuals, companies, agencies may look very differently at these pictures when we actually assess, uh, when, when an actual price begins to appear. Keeping up the overall interest in making this happen as those costs do come online, which I believe they need to, is part of the addressing these issues. It's a huge challenge. Um, I'm glad we're trying it, but where, how it leads, we're going to, you know, we're working on mechanisms now, but we shall see. Great, great question. I know I have to run up there. Apologies. So, well, thank you guys. We appreciate it.